The hippie movement of the 1960s brought with it the promise of a world based on peace and love, where freedom, connection with nature, and the rejection of materialism would be the pillars. Young people from all over the world adhered to these ideals, creating communes to live in harmony, away from the system they criticized so much. In New Zealand, these communities spread in the 1970s, transforming remote areas into true refugees of tranquility and spirituality. However, not everything was as idyllic as it sounds. Over time, some of these communes became dark and even frightening environments, full of bizarre practices and internal conflicts. What began as a dream of freedom and brotherhood has become distorted, giving way to controlling and disturbing environments. Some of these communities, which once flourished under the motto of love and cooperation, have come to be compared to cults, where abusive and toxic behavior has taken over. Today, Belo Mundo takes you on a journey through New Zealand, exploring its curiosities and, at the same time, uncovering this dark and sick part of the history of hippie communes, which look like scenes from a horror movie. In the southwest corner of the Pacific Ocean, isolated from almost everything, lies New Zealand. The country is made up of two large islands, the North Island and the South Island, as well as smaller ones such as Stewart Island, each with its own charms. The North Island is home to most of the population and is home to major cities such as Wellington, the capital, and Auckland, the largest of them all. The island is also famous for its volcanic landscapes and geysers. The less inhabited South Island impresses with its mountains, forests, and spectacular lakes. This is where Mount Cook, the highest point in the country at over 3,700 meters, dominates the scene. With an area of 268,000 square kilometers, New Zealand may seem small, but its natural diversity is gigantic. From beaches and subtropical forests in the north to fjords and snow-capped mountains in the south, every part of the country is breathtaking. A curious fact is that despite being a small country, New Zealand has one of the longest coastlines in the world. There are around 15,000 kilometers of coastline and more than 15,000 beaches. Can you believe it? No matter where you are, there's always a beach no more than 130 kilometers away. Being on the Pacific Ring of Fire, the country also has several volcanoes scattered around the islands, with traces of volcanic activity everywhere. Twelve of them are still active and closely monitored by scientists. Among them is Mount Ruapehu, made famous in the movies as Mount Doom in The Lord of the Rings. To give you an idea, Auckland, the country's largest city, is literally on top of a volcanic field with 53 volcanoes. Is it or isn't it a fascinating place? And if you like crystal clear waters, here's a cool fact. Blue Lake on the South Island is considered to be the clearest lake in the world. According to a 2011 study by the New Zealand National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research, Blue Lake has an impressive visibility of up to 80 meters. Can you imagine the beauty of this place? And with so much beauty and variety, it's no wonder that this nation has been the setting for several film productions. It's almost impossible to talk about New Zealand without mentioning The Lord of the Rings. The trilogy, one of the most successful in history, both at the box office and in the hearts of fans, brought to the screen the fantastic world of Middle-earth adventures, with its epic creatures and stunning scenery brought to life in the country. Interestingly, many of the film locations have become real tourist attractions there. Fans can follow a special itinerary that takes in places like Matamata, where Hobbiton is located, and Kaotoke Regional Park, as well as the iconic Mount Ngauruho, which became Mount Doom. But New Zealand wasn't just the setting for The Lord of the Rings. Another famous series that made use of its landscapes was 
The Chronicles of Narnia, based on the children's classic by C.S. Lewis. Remember the battle between Aslan and the White Witch's army? It was filmed at Flock Hill Station in the Catterbury area. And for those who enjoy action movies, New Zealand was also home to the filming of Wolverine Origins. The story of how young James Howlett becomes the famous Wolverine came to life in places like Queenstown, Deer Park Heights, and the beaches of Kingston, as well as volcanoes, crystal clear lakes, and cinematic scenery. New Zealand has another surprise in abundance. Animals. Believe it or not, 95% of New Zealand's population is made up of animals, leaving only 5% for humans. Among the native birds, the kiwi is the great symbol. This flightless nocturnal bird holds a special place in the hearts of New Zealanders. The country's fauna also includes the tuatara, a dinosaur-era reptile, the Hector's dolphin, one of the smallest dolphins in the world, and the rare yellow-eyed penguin. Now, speaking of numbers, the title of most numerous goes to the sheep. The country has around nine sheep for every inhabitant. In 2020, there were approximately 45 million sheep for a population of 5 million people. That's a lot of sheep. And do you want to know something even more interesting? There are no snakes in the whole of New Zealand. That's right. For those who are terrified of reptiles, the country is a true paradise. And that's not all. There are no scorpions or crocodiles there either. I don't know about you, but I was very pleased to hear that. If you like a good dose of adrenaline, you'll be pleased to know that New Zealand is the birthplace of the famous bungee jumping. It was there, in the city of Queenstown, the extreme sports capital of the world, that this thrill-seeking craze rose to fame. The two pioneers in the sport, considered crazy by many, were A.J. Hackett and Henry Van Asch, who developed the first studies and tests with the ropes that today hold thousands of people in their jumps around the world. After some tests in France, they decided that it was necessary to make a public jump to confirm their idea. That's when Hackett came up with the idea of jumping from the Eiffel Tower in Paris in 1987. He was arrested and released minutes later, but the goal was accomplished. Bungee jumping became known. A year later, they set up the first commercial jumping point on the Kawarau Bridge, over the river of the same name. The initial license to provide the service was only for 30 days. They didn't believe the craze would attract many people. That year, 28 people jumped, and the two founders began investing in safety to solidify the service. It is still taken seriously today. The company has never recorded any fatal accidents, and all the items are checked several times during the jump by different people. Since then, thousands of brave people from all over the world have come to take that breathtaking leap. And of course, you can try it too if you're brave enough. Even though New Zealand is an independent country, it still has King Charles as its head of state. This is because the country is part of the Commonwealth, an organization that brings together 56 countries with a common history linked to the former British Empire. Before him, this position was held by Queen Elizabeth II until her death. The relationship between New Zealand and Great Britain began in 1916 when the British navigator Captain James Cook began European colonization in the country. At first, the government was exercised by a governor appointed by the crown, but the settlers soon began to demand more autonomy and seek independence. And let's face it, it was a process that unfolded slowly, almost at a standstill. To give you an idea, it wasn't until 1948, almost a hundred years later, that New Zealanders stopped being considered British citizens and officially became citizens of New Zealand. The road to complete independence continued over the years. In 1986, 
Parliament passed the Constitution Act, which gave the country full legal independence. With all this history of British colonization, it's easy to imagine that English is New Zealand's official language. And indeed it is. But the country has two other official languages besides English. Maori, the native language, and sign language, which in 2006 was also recognized as an official language, making New Zealand one of the few countries in the world with such an inclusive approach to communication. While we're on the subject of languages, here's another incredible curiosity about New Zealand, the biggest word in the local vocabulary. And it's not just any word, it's the name of a 305 meter high hill. This gigantic word has no less than 82 letters. Of course, you can't say it off the top of your head, but here you go. Hard to read, isn't it? The translation isn't far behind and looks something like this. The top of the hill where Tamatea, the man with the big knees, who descended, climbed and swallowed mountains to travel the earth, known as the Earth Eater, played the nasal flute for his beloved. It doesn't make much sense to me, but it was interesting to hear. And obviously, if we're talking about New Zealand, the Maori can't be left off our list. So let's find out a bit more about this community. The first Maori arrived in the territory in the 13th century from Polynesia and were descendants of the same navigators who colonized islands like Hawaii. Maori culture is full of spirituality. For them, everything in nature has a spirit called mana, which represents a vital force. Mountains, rivers, and even objects created by humans have this mana. And interestingly, if someone is not allowed to touch something with mana, this force can disappear and bring bad luck to the tribe. But when it comes to the Maori, the haka immediately springs to mind. If you've ever watched an All Blacks rugby match, you've seen this powerful war dance. The haka is a war mantra, a dance designed to intimidate the enemy and show that fear is not part of the picture. During the haka, the dancers make intense facial expressions, show their muscles and beat their feet and arms in sync. The posture is that of someone ready to attack, and the gesture of sticking out the tongue has two meanings. For some, it's a way of scaring. For others, it's an unfriendly invitation. The enemy could end up being the main course at dinner. Another hallmark of Maori culture is the hongi, their traditional form of greeting. The gesture involves touching foreheads and noses, symbolizing respect and an understanding of each other's souls. Amazing, isn't it? In addition to the Maori, another movement that drew a lot of attention in New Zealand was the hippie communes that emerged and spread in the 1970s. Inspired by the American movement, these alternative communities had a clear objective, to oppose the system, in other words, the middle-class society that valued materialism and consumption. Based on the principles of cooperation and nonviolence, their pacifist ideals spread all over the world, including New Zealand. Some were true utopias of tranquility, while others, however, didn't exactly follow the peace and love spirit and became toxic environments, full of bizarre practices, and were even compared to cults for their dark and controlled behavior. And to start talking about these communities, let's start with the peculiar, but totally peace and love community. Karuna Falls founded in 1976 in the heart of the Coromandel Peninsula. This commune was centered on spirituality and a life in harmony with nature. One of the most interesting principles was the practice of silence at certain times of the day to allow residents to connect spiritually and meditate. In addition, respect for the spiritual energy of nature was central and every building or garden was designed to preserve this energy. One of the most curious traditions at Karuna Falls was the purification ritual at its waterfalls. 
The members believed that the water had healing powers, and weekly ceremonies were held to cleanse negative energies and renew the connection with the earth, and believe it or not, it still exists today. Another Hiponga community that emerged at the time was Mahana. Founded in 1978, it began as a promise of an alternative life, in harmony with nature and far from traditional norms such as capitalism, consumerism and the government and social institutions that support them. The beginning seemed like a dream. The community attracted young people who wanted to live collectively, sharing land and resources. At its peak, Mahana was home to around 60 members, all united by the desire to live sustainably and in communion with the land. However, the harmony was short-lived. Over the years, internal tensions began to grow, mainly over land ownership. The community became divided between those who wanted to maintain the original spirit of collectivity, where no one owned anything individually, and others who wanted private ownership of parts of the land. These disagreements led to constant fighting and, eventually, acts of sabotage. One of the most notorious incidents was the deliberate destruction of a house, which prevented new members from moving into the community. This event symbolized the breakdown of the principles of cooperation and unity that initially united Mahana. With the lack of strong leadership and constant disputes, the commune went into decline and many of its members ended up leaving. Today, Mahana is just a shadow of its former self. The few remaining residents report the degradation of the environment as a whole, resulting in the collapse of the utopia that Mahana once dreamed of being. And you can't talk about Hippong communities without mentioning Centerpoint. In fact, no discussion of alternative communities in New Zealand would be complete without mentioning Centerpoint, widely considered to be the most problematic commune in the country. Founded in 1978 by Bert Potter, a controversial therapist, it attracted hundreds of people in search of personal freedom and inner growth. The commune offered an alternative lifestyle based on unconventional therapies, which included public nudity and the exploration of sexuality as a form of personal growth. Bert's confrontational therapy methods included giving people bizarre tasks. One example of this bizarreness was a couple who were about to get married and were instructed to chase each other around the lawn for five minutes every day, naked, slapping each other's buttocks. And that was the most normal of events. Although the proposal initially attracted many hippie enthusiasts, the community soon found itself embroiled in serious scandals. The practices of Potter and the Commune came under investigation when allegations of abuse emerged, especially in relation to minors. Almost 12 years later, after a series of cruel acts, justice finally came. Centerpoint's reputation was ruined, and the community was officially closed down in the year 2000. And so we conclude our journey through these dark and fascinating sects, which have left a frightening mark on history. If you want to continue delving into curious and intriguing topics, keep an eye out for upcoming videos, and don't forget to turn on your notifications so you don't miss a thing. Thanks for sticking with us to the end. See you in the next episode of this unforgettable journey through our Bello Mundo. See you there.